What? You are here, lovely. Consensus. Oh wow, just like that, huh? <laughs> you see how she did that? You see how she did that? <laughs> like, yeah. Lovely. Every single podcast, I'm, I'm realizing you're just you just snipping it off. I'm like, she's okay, like, well, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Okay, got Sorry. it. Record. <laughs> yeah, like, the answer was like, yep, okay. She knows what she's gonna talk about. Fine. Okay, let's write. We ready to go? Let's make it happen. I love I'll, y'all. I'll, I'll put a time stop. Ratchetness and everything. I love y'all for real. <laughs> <laughs> love y'all for real. Uh, what's it called? A family? <laughs> like my babies? What's her my name? Uh, 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 Monique. Monique. Yeah, she finally got her Netflix deal. And, finally she, did. And, and you know, that's what I love. I actually really love that. You know why I love no, that? No, I don't love I, it. I'm like, I, I it rewards it. bad behavior. It's side, it's side eye. You did all that. <laughs> no, even though she did all that, that shows you that executives and business owners are going to make the decision that they need to make for the business, period. Because although she, you know, I was going to use that. She's a problem. Then it's again, a Netflix is kind of plummeting in subscribers. So maybe yeah, pulling so up the I'm, black woman I'm, and putting her on the show. Me, so. Yeah, this is going to yeah. show you. So we as a consumer's outsiders, right? are doing all this hoopla around it. But at the end of the day, these are executives and people that are running business. So this is also publicity, her acting this way. And now you can argue if it's good, you can argue- It's, it's menstrual. It's a, it's can, a menstrual show. Yeah, uh, you, you, you uh, can argue maestro? all the things. Uh, not menstrual, menstrual sounds like, that's biological, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's, it, we can it's argue menstrual. all the things. It, menstrual? I th- menstrual, I don't know. Like, yeah, there's a there's a different word. I didn't want to say the wrong one because it's a oh. menstrual period. Like it's a whole different thing. That's yeah, so off like, topic. Go ahead, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where Lauren's going with that one. Go ahead, lovely. Are People are, gonna somebody's going to be listening to this. <laughs> so that's what I'm asking. Are we starting from a top or we're we just going to go into it? Like this is this? it. This is this, this is the is start. It. You may wow. as well intro us. Intro wow. us. Wow, 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 wow. So welcome to the Financial Creole Podcast. <laughs> we are civilized people on occasion. But today is one of those days that you got to enter the conversation. I was going to say something, but it was going to be a bad joke. So I'm going to reverse that. Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a good day. I'm with Lawrence and Atlanta. We're all three here, which is really good, which means you're going to get some good, solid episodes coming in for at least the next couple of weeks. So what's up, everybody? Hey, what's up, everyone? My name is Atlanta, another co-host of TFG, aka The Financial Grio. Thanks for tuning in. Well, I'm gonna answer Lovely's question. How's how you how am I doing? I'm doing fine, even though I'm coming off of COVID a little bit. Alana just jumped into saying her name all over again, which is kind of weird. But you know, that's that's um HBCU logic for you. And I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> Let's get this conversation. How are you wow. feeling? Wow. LG, how are you feeling? I am feeling I'm feeling all right. Like earlier this week, I probably had the, the worst part of it. But like yeah. I was saying uh, to other people at my, my job, it felt more like my severe allergies. Mm. And typically that gives me bad sinuses, give me impacted ear, give me the cold cough, so on and so forth. So it felt a lot like that and probably even a little bit milder. Uh, I did get the chills um, here and there. But for the most part, I took my days off. Like I was looking at my boss, like day off, bro, I'm out. So I was off from um, Monday to Wednesday and I clocked back in on Thursday when it's like, oh, I was waiting for you to, to, to do this meeting. I'm like, you didn't have to wait, bro. You did not have to wait. <laughs> you could have done the meeting. So, so, how, so how many days good. you took off? I took off three days. I already was going to take off Wednesday um, prior to that um, period, but it just turns out that it just fell into this one. So I just took the three days off and just recoup. I think a lot of people, especially uh, black and brown people, we're so used to kind of keep going to work, keep going to work, or even work remote, remotely while we were sick. This time I was like, you know what? I'm old enough. I just don't want to do that no more. I'm just going to take my time off and I'm just going to kick back. I, I'm going to recover as best as I can. That's the lesson. Lesson. It, it definitely is a big lesson. But even when I was at my corporate job, I never had qualms of taking the time off. I took... Hmm. It was a lot of days off when I needed them. When I worked, I worked though. I was really good at what I did. So, but when it was time for me to take it off, I didn't blink because I, I I knew the back end. I know what's really going on. When you keep working or you're not working well, like you think that you're gonna stop things, but reality is, if you croaked over, some it sounds very morbid. That that position that you have, they would have been putting it up to replace you anyway. So, my thought process: if I'm not well, goodbye guys. I'll see you when I feel well. Seriously, I agree with uh, I agree with Lovely because 
working in corporate or any nine to five office job can be very draining and you have to meet the productivity and the level of productivity that they're expected of you, right? So I never, never gave any uh, doubts <laughs> of taking PTO, even within the last, I say four or five years, what I used to do, what well, I still do actually life hack is um, I think close to mid, mid month, well, mid year, um, nah, closer to the year, end of the year, maybe September, October, I will start requesting next year off. So all of the three day holidays that we have in a year, <laughs> I am gone. <laughs> so um, I, I do the Labor Day, Memorial Day, MLK Day, I think President's Day, we get off any observed holiday that my company has. I am the girl that typically had that first four or five months off for those three weekends. <laughs> I utilize my PTO, which is paid time off as much as possible because you need that break. You know, your life is not essentially just being in the office. You're more than your nine to five. Surely is. And I, uh, to caveat as well, I do know that if you're working in certain industries that have unlimited PTO and limited vacation, that you do might have a little bit more liberty than than others, but still find out what your your requirements are and also find out your state laws. That's another thing. A lot of companies get away with a lot of stuff because we are in an uninformed and we don't know our rights. So things like um, you, if you say you're sick, you have to bring a doctor's note. There's legislation for that in every state. There is a way that um, you can stand up for yourself because it's not every time that you're you're sick that you actually go to the doctor. You might just be sick enough for you not to necessarily be able to perform. I can understand if you're taking a week off, two weeks, that's a different conversation. But nonetheless, when you're talking about in regards to like a one or two days or three days, a lot of jobs will give people pressure. But at the end of the day, if you know, you know your rights and you understand like, hey, the company has guidelines, but the state, especially like for me that lives in the Northeast, they are really, really big on making sure that the employers are doing their due diligence to have a safe and safe environment for people to work in, which includes making sure that you have PTO, also making sure that you can leverage your PTO because sometimes companies have it on paper, but then you HR makes it difficult or whoever's over HR tells them, hey, this is what you have to do and come down and throw these employees, but know your rights so that you can actually exercise what you need for yourself. I don't know how we got into this bag, but here we are. And these these are the gems that won't get you to jail. So this is so this is the one. Man, some gems, some gems. I but let's talk about this. Let's be talking about credit cards. Yeah, let's talk about. The, the, we'll, we'll talk about some about the, the 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 scammers later. But let's get this credit card. As long as you're not doing the credit card repairs with the scammers. No, we're, we're oh man, we're no. Oh, that. that actually that actually coincides, if I'm not mistaken, correct? You might well, want to put that in. Coincide. Well, I mean, it's just so much scams going on. They have scams for student loans. They got scams for credit cards. They got scams for housing. They got scams for just drinking water. This just doesn't make sense. So and, it goes, it's all ties in, really. So you can bring up the incident with the, the credit repair woman and the history of credit cards. So we can go all in if you guys want. Let's go. Uh, somebody what? intro lovely let's go it's you, you wow it's, wow you. I, I introed and now i'm i'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually catching up so like I'm, I'm here but let me just catch up on wow me. wow no no this 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 for this is what uh, happens when you do a group project and then you know your peers are really unprepared you know I'm what no joking. lovely don't joking. come for me <laughs> <laughs> you just did this article are, you just said this article <laughs> but some people were eating fancy breakfasts you know uh -huh. and they just just couldn't couldn't avocado read the material toast. that avocado toast every Everyone, time go that, check out lovely on ig <laughs> the lifestyle the experience of cooking with miss lovely totally different oh. than my real life <laughs> so wow not, wow the shade not. that's been being thrown in our messenger chat everyone the shade it's specifically lawrence let me I, petty petty they're, they're beautiful they're very calm and soothing Thank i had you. a friend ask me about who when i i don't think i tagged you i think it was on whatsapp but they really like it so i'm enjoying it Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's my stress relief. So, okay, let's be serious group project members. Um, so we're going to talk today about the history of credit cards and I'll give you context of why we're going to be talking about it. So we are in this impending in, um, recession. I'm putting air quotes here because everybody's been talking about it for a very long time. And people are, are we in a recession? Are we heading to a recession? What is it? And um, Lawrence mentioned in our conversation earlier today, like, hey, people are actually really pretty nervous. People are feeling under pressure. And the only reason why we haven't really seen 
it impact yet to, to fully is because as Americans, we love to shop. We love to engage in commerce, whether now we have it in the fingertips of our phone or a local mall, we are spending money. But however, we are often spending money through um, killing debt, which is usage of credit cards. Um, if you listen to any Financial Grio podcast, you know that we're not against uses of credit card or we don't feel like, oh, this is the worst thing in the world. But we also do know that some people don't have the bandwidth, the discipline to actually execute it execute on it. So today we'll talk about the history of um, credit cards. We're going to talk about the impacts and implications of today. How do you leverage your credit cards? And maybe you are one of those people that just need to cut them off. So I'm going to let LG, Alana share their thoughts and then I'll come back and share mine. Yeah, I think, uh, thanks for doing that great intro. Um, especially in this day and age, we are finding that people are not slowing down spending. I know you kind of put it in, a, in a nicer terms, but in truth, like <laughs> we're uh, our spending culture right now. And even though prices are going up on gas, groceries, or in all types of other things to the point where I believe the unaverage, most, most everybody in America, most households would like to likely spend an additional $5,000 to $6,000 this year, just on an increasing costs. And because of it, we're going to see that people are going to rely extensively on credit. And that's something that we've never had in the past in the U.S. Um, and even like in the modern um, society that we never had this access until, in my opinion, 1990. It wasn't uh, proliferated out there. Yes, businesses use credit cards. Yes, some business uh, managers would travel overseas and use credit cards. And that was the thing. But it wasn't until 1990 until that one commercial out. I still remember to this day visa anywhere you want to be i was like what the heck is a visa and at that point the marketing pushed it out there and people started finding that credit wasn't you know you had an access point to credit older people didn't want to get it at the time and our generation went through school and the first thing that we saw at the student unions were uh credit card companies selling us the credit card like capital one so on and so forth so now we're in a situation where that even though costs are going up and income is not going up as high as the cost, you're finding that people are relying on credit to actually live the lifestyle that they, they feel that they deserve. And I'll pass it over to Alana. Yeah, you made some great points about the credit card usage that we are seeing now because more people are relying on their credit cards. And I was reading the article that um, Lovely had posted on our group message and to just give you just a, a full timeline, chronicle timeline on how the credit card industry became as big as it is now. Um, and Lawrence made a great point is, you know, we do remember and recall, you know, how marketing uh, kind of just exploded when it came to um, placing credit card easily in people's hands. But I also want to give you guys just a brief history that I remember uh, reading, was seen on a documentary, but actually reading about it is um, most credit card companies, uh, had a lot of regulation. This is like early 90s, maybe 80s, 90s. Had a lot of state and federal re regulation of how much they can uh, charge a consumer uh, interest, right? So a lot of tax obligations and all this other stuff. So they didn't really, they weren't making a lot of profit for a consumer because a lot of people were paying back the, uh, the credit that they were using. It was until... I think Utah or Nebraska or, or Omaha, one of those places out Midwest, had to be Midwest, where they were falling short economically on their state where they needed more businesses. People wasn't, wasn't going to these populations like, oh, let me start a life here, right? So um, what they did was they actually lifted state regulation to say like, hey, your credit card company, your business, we'll give you all these taxes, uh, free liabilities, all these things, and there's no interest here. So a lot of credit card companies begin setting up in these locations. So think about it. When you get a new credit card, you see that state that says Omaha, Nebraska, all these other places, right? Because those states don't have the uh, regulation like other states um, that had like 20, 30 years ago, right? So they implanted the headquarters there. Now, what happened in, in that history timeline is uh, they start to send out credit cards to other, um, other consumers, just people across the country, but market. There was a guy who was working for, I don't, I forgot, forgot what, you know, bank industry, but he was known in the bank finance industry. He started working with these credit card companies to say like, how can we get more people 
to have access to credit. Because when you think about it, credit was a, a, having a credit card was a, a privilege. <laughs> you had to have income, like all these like standards, right? But uh, once these credit card companies start going to these Midwest um, states to set up, they hire this person to market. There's like, how can we do this? Like, how can we get more people? Great idea, zero APR the first three months, zero APR, the first six months. Once that market start exploding <laughs> and market into like television, radio, people became more consumed and just more just uh, in tune with getting a credit card because they felt as though they had more time to pay it off. And that was the scam in itself. So we were growing up, we probably see it here and there, but the market got better and better and better. And more people, like I think before I was, I think I was turning 18 the day after I receive a credit card offer. I'm like, how did they know? <laughs> I was turning 18. I received a credit card offer in the mail. So these was all the things in marketing and all these uh, schemes that was going on. And now we're seeing 20, 40 years later uh, how this is actually impacting uh, communities is because we're solely relying on credit cards to offset our lifestyles. So um, that's a, a short history <laughs> for you guys, but um, now with inflation and social impact um, and, and mentally how people are just placing all their priorities on just um, their credit is really affecting people for um, years to come because it's not a short-term thing, it's become a very long-term problem. Yeah, I was like, I, you didn't know that, huh? Long as I, well, I knew all that. I'm like, I'm like why okay. did she have to do all that? Why did she have to do all that? Like an expose, like straight up. I thought it was good. <laughs> no, it, was good. it was good. I think the audience is going to really enjoy it. Because I think there's something to be said about um, corporate responsibility, right? And this is actually so a defense that we've been talking about in one of my case studies is what is corporate responsibility and what does it mean? Do companies like credit card companies, they're in it to make money. Like Elena said, in the beginning, they weren't making as much. They weren't turning the profit as much. And so they get this new marketing to come in. And it's like, well, I have 18 months. And here's what happens to the human brain in a way. Delayed gratification, all these things that require like discipline, oftentimes we don't exercise them. So what ends up happening is like, oh, I can, I have like six months to, to pay. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And then what happens is like six months down the line, maybe you got your car broke down and you had to spend money somewhere else or something else happened and now you can't afford to. So guess what they do? They run back every interest that they would have charged you sometimes if you didn't fulfill that requirement within the six months. And so I think it's interesting to say how, yes, I think we are some, most people are aware that this could be consequential, but I think because we don't want the delayed the gratification, we want the incent, hey, I want this right now, I need to make it happen right now. We go ahead and swipe, 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 swipe until then the consequences are later. And there are a lot of people that are crippled by the credit card debt or crippled by the fact that this is really going to cause them not to be able to get what they want in the long run. But in the time being, they want to. And I think that's why we're seeing such a big aspect online of people telling people, quite frankly, lies that most likely if you get caught, you will probably do some jail time because it's just it's just not right. So there is a lot of credit card scams or how to get more credit or how to lie on your, you know, get more and tell them you have more income than you really do have and all these different things. And I think people don't realize that you're, you think that you're gaming the system, but the system's about to game you. And so it's just so much that we can talk about or kind of go down a rabbit hole, but I think it was good for us to be able to give a, a, a brief overview of where did this come from? How does it impact people? And the question is like, if somebody is 50, 30, whatever thousand dollars in, in credit card debt, where do they start? Um, is it like, hey, I need to stop usage? Or do some people have the discipline to say, I'm using these for points and credits? Or maybe it's just a cold turkey. You just have to kind of depend on who you are and how you process information. Yeah, I think those um, solutions have always been simple. They've always been in our face and wealth doesn't have to be this complicated. You just have to stop spending money. Uh, I'm, at some point in time, I'm not quite sure what age group that we were in, but we start conflating happiness with spending. And then we also, by proxy, start conflating spending and happiness with using the credit card. 
So it's not only that, hey, you might not be able to afford this. Well, technically, if you have a credit card and you have the limit, you could go out to brunch anytime that you feel like, or you could go travel anytime that you feel like, or you could go buy whatever you want to buy online right now at the point of a click because it's so accessible to you. And mm. to Alana's point, a lot of people aren't necessarily, they're, they're putting it away, but it's something that they're going to be dealing for a long time to come. And it's going to tax the American public or the average household or average user for a very long time. You have, um, I believe the average balance right now is around like $6,000 for uh, use, usage on credit cards, like that carrying over month over month. On top of that, I think the, the actual interest rate is around like 21%. So you have people carrying these balances that's going to take them probably 17 years to pay if they're just doing minimum payments. And it's going to cost them double the cost that they ever um, um, bought those um, $6,000 worth of products for. So every time that you buy anything with a credit card, just think about it that way, that you're basically buying it twice. You're buying it you know, at the full price, let's say it's $100. But you're, if you're going to pay minimum payments for whatever amount of years to come, it's going to cost you an additional $100 more. So if you buy something for five grand, it's going to end up costing you five grand in interest. So if people start putting their, um, their dollars into perspective, maybe they, they'll realize that it's not worth it anymore to buy whatever that is. Just like the meme said, if you're over 35, you likely have two of them at home. Leave it alone. <laughs> not two of them <laughs> well, you'd be like mm, maybe do i need the, the do i need a pizza cutter i'm like nah you probably already got it at home stop you it. already have it it's it's one of the other things that i think small things it's funny that that me mentioned that the other day we went to trader joe's right and so i'm looking at those like garlic dip with the side because i'm like dang i could have sworn i saw one in the fridge hmm so i passed it and then i came back i'm like no but i make it with i make it with broccoli and i eat a lot of broccoli right now so it's like ah, oh, let me get it and when i came home long behold i didn't have one but it didn't have a lot and i was like oh thank god because it's like one of those things where you do start to pile up on more than you need and then sometimes things go to waste so you got to throw things out and i think um one thing that i realized recently is even if you have it you don't necessarily know what's going to happen in life. And I think the last couple of months of my life has taught me that where recently, like um, my sister was in a bind about something and it's like, oh, yeah, a thousand dollars here. Or something else comes up. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, five hundred dollars here. Then seconds add up. They add up. And so you don't want to kind of like live from this um, vibe vike vi it's a creole word so y'all just gonna have to vibe, vibe with it because i can't think of an english one right now but you don't want to live that way because essentially there's a cost i think if there's one thing i'm learning is whether or not you want to pay it or not there's a cost to the decisions that we make good or bad whether it's your health whether it's your finances whether it's how you handle relationships how you handle people in just your workplace and i think we live in a generation that's like man f this job and it's like okay that's cool but the reality is like you might be homeless like <laughs> you might have to kind of like do a balance check and i think we're often not willing to endure any little thing that causes us to just say you know what i'm just gonna go like i literally was reading an article recently that says millennials out of all like the current generations we're willing to spend five thousand dollars on a vacation we're willing to do it the $5,000 on vacation is not the problem. The question is, how are you funding it? And is it causing you to eat up into your future self? Is your 50-year-old self, 60-year-old self looking at you shaking their head like, dang, we are about to be in some trouble if we don't change the way we live. And, you know, the best time could have been yesterday, but today is today. So do something about it today. So it's, it's just amazing to me to see us as a society and what's ruling us. And I think that we, this is the first time that, mass culture can be analyzed in this way because we're living it in a virtual world. Whereas before it was like historic, people are talking about it and trends were, trends have to be studied for a very long time to realize, oh, this is a trend. But now I think you can get a little bit more social posts on things because of how we're living online and how it's impacting us. So it's interesting. Yeah, people are outside right now. That's for sure. People have not stopped, even though I'm hearing a lot of, uh, a lot of people complaining, um, and I think that's just also part of the culture now. We have a lot of people that are stuck into, you know, really being uh, 
that's the easiest word uh, maybe there's a nicer word for it but always kind of finding fault or complaining about everything 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 but yet they still go right back outside they'll say that oh, well yeah. prices are going up but I, I saw them outside i say oh i i'm not getting you know my, my money is not going as far as it, it used to but you still see them right back outside so there's there's this like weird disconnect between what we need to do and what we uh want what to we do. want to do Exactly. It, it doesn't make any sense. Like if you keep saying that, hey, things are costing more, then it's likely time that you slow down and stay at home more, especially now that we have so much access to even entertainment at home. You barely have to go to the movies, period, anymore, because all of it just comes to the t- you know, your screen. You have hours of content. You have nonstop entertainment, but yet you still want to go back outside it's not like you're going back outside to do some kind of, hey, I'm going to go running outside or I'm just going to go biking or something like that. No, they just want to go back outside to go spend money. And I think in this culture, we're probably going to have to come uh, to the realization that we have a spending problem. We're addicted to it. If there is yeah, a, a universal called, addiction, that's the addiction. Retail, it's called retail therapy. I think people want to be to feel OK. And sometimes you go, you get a nice shoe, you're like, hmm, OK problems not not happening in this moment or whatever it may be um I think we're missing out on community I talk to all my friends about it I am trying to see what we can do in terms of my own friends groups like how can we actually do life together where it's not necessarily it doesn't have to be lavish it doesn't have to be five star everything champagne bottles being thrown up it can be a potluck of people coming together and cooking together and laughing and telling jokes. And and I think we don't realize the simplicity of joy and happiness. I think if it's not complex, we deem it not necessary. Like I live in mass and there are plenty of things to do that just doesn't cost. Like you can go to Boston Commons, you can walk the history, you can do so many different things here and there and still be able to enjoy life. But I do think that there is a connection with if it's not luxe, if it's not high end, that I don't need to do it. When I really think what we're really trying to crave is acceptance acceptance and community and relationship. And I don't think we've we found a way to do it. I think um, the the generation behind us, they are the generation that's having the least sex. Um, They a lot more virgins in that way, but not in a good way of like, oh, they're just, you know, waiting for. No, they're they're so bad at communicating and connecting that their their controllers have literally been become their connection and i think all of that plays a role into why people are trying to peacock and trying to find some level of acceptance or likability it's because we are we have we're not necessarily okay with ourselves and the way we used to build community relationship has been broken and i think we think that it can be fixed through this online world but i think we're realizing that it's not really true and that's why you also see the level of suicides the way it is. We need community. We actually, that's actually something that as human beings is so important. But I think because of the way we are, we're going about it in a very, I don't even know what word to use. Oh, but toxic it's not, way. It's toxic. Yeah, essentially. Yep. We're meeting our needs in a very um, a, a destructive way and toxic. I'll say this. I think a lot of people look at if it's if I didn't spend any dollars on it then it's not worth it and that's the problem even you know the the time that we spend with other people for some reason it's not as valuable anymore if if you didn't Instagram it did it actually count if it, if you didn't get like some likes did it actually mean anything so we're gonna see a lot of people struggle with that because of the idea that um, communities have been fractured and pushed and pulled to a certain degree because even all three of us are living in three different states so it's not like we're down the street anymore from each other. It's not like when I grew up in the 80s where you could go down, you know, down the street to somebody's house in what, five, 10 minutes, and you could be, you know, hanging out playing dominoes all day. We're not doing that anymore. Everybody lives so far apart, even when they're best friends, even when they're in the same quote unquote city. Like you might not live down the block from your best friend. They might live, you know, a good 30 minutes, 40 minutes out from you. And I think that's going to be the challenge for a lot of um, people going into the future because the distance that we're creating within ourselves, we have to also fill that in with money and spending again. Right. All these were great points. Um, And I think sometimes, too, where we're not really seeing in the 
the connection that we do have when it comes to um, the internet, the, the, the thing that connect, uh, connect us to the world globally, information disconnect us in reality as well. So those really good points that everyone was making. I think sometimes too, we don't realize that we do have the power to make the changes that we need to make. And mentally, even for myself, I'm realizing because I'm not much of a spender, but lately I just been swiping, swipe, swipe since my COVID because <laughs> DoorDash was so easily accessible to me, right? So now I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm identifying there's a, there's a pattern right now because I have DoorDash uh, app. I didn't cook anything. Let me get DoorDash, <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm seeing those things because um, it was so easy and so com convenient, but it's something that I realized that if I am a spender, if I do not want to continue eating out, then I do have to make the uh, reservation to just push myself into cook. Uh, cook, you know, earlier, if I'm not feeling, you know, some to cook be at the work. These are things I'm not identifying. And, but when you're constantly have your phone around and you're looking at these apps when you're on the internet or you're reading these things, it's like, oh, there's an app. Let me just, you know, purchase something. So I'm identifying those things within myself. Um, so a, another point that I will make, it's not like gloom. It's not <laughs> like, you know, your life is forever damaged because of credit card. We have to make a decision to say that if this is something that you really want to change, you really want to identify you are fully capable of changing that and doing so and I think the first things that you need to kind of like set boundary on is to look at your credit card statement see how much the interest rate that you are being uh, charged each month that you're carrying a balance that you're not paying off a lot of people don't know these things Lawrence mentioned earlier in the episode 21 percent is the average rate of most credit card interest rates and most people don't know what their credit card uh, interest is being accumulated day after day after day when you're not making the full statement balance um, statement balance as well as the full month balance of your credit card so please just be mindful of like all these little small nuances and information because it will cost you. And I will say the second thing, it should be the primary thing is really, and I'm, I'm working on this, <laughs> is refrain from online engagements. Um, the more time you spend online, I think it's a, a mental disconnection too. You feel like you need these things because like everyone was saying, because we don't have close friends um, anymore that in proximity of each other it is hard to get outside or it is hard to feel you know that you have these people around but essentially you don't and you feel this with so much of consumption all the time I remember I was thinking about these shoes that I seen online and I it forever read for I don't know what happened but Amazon just posts you know an ad on my Facebook I'm like oh these shoes again right so there's no mistake of them marketers are paying millions of dollars for these people to strategically place these ads and everything so they can get you to spend. So that's something that you have to identify. So please refrain from online, uh, so much online engagement. Just take a break, go outside. I'm here in South Florida, so I try to make it uh, imperative to go outside and get some sunshine and get some vitamin D and, or just take a walk. Um, I live in a really nice neighborhood. I'm just like, dang, I'm always in and out, you know, work, you know, and I'm not taking the time to just breathe and just walk around this beautiful lake that I have. So you have to kind of take, you know, in consumption of what you actually have in front of you and stop trying to replace everything else that you have to buy. I'm surprised we didn't talk about the scam. <laughs> hey, these scams, hey, that's, that's a whole, that's, in my opinion, a scam episode is a whole other thing because there's just too many of these credit card repairs um, and these people offering or saying miraculous thing that's going to happen with your credit. And I think part of it is the desperation too, because a lot of people are seeing their friends, like you said, online, going out, traveling to Colombia or whatever it is, Tulum, Mexico, and every, and, and it's, it's constant, it's nonstop. So it's not the marketers do it anymore. I think it's even more engagement that you're getting from your actual peer group and maybe you need to stop following some people. If that's all they post and they never post anything about really changing or whatever it is, maybe they're not giving you what you need and you need to kind of step away from it. It doesn't mean that you hate the person, but you need to kind of decide for yourself the type of environment that you're, that's going to foster your growth. 
especially all this is just algorithm. So the algorithm is following you, it's following what you like, it's following the people you like. So if you like these things, it's all, always bombard you. But if you get to a point where you feel overwhelmed by it, log off. And you'll start noticing that the world is not every, it's about everybody that you see online. It's about everybody that you see in your proximity, your neighbors, your friends, your family members, the gro at the grocery store, the clerks. These are the real people that you interact with. And they don't necessarily need to go somewhere famous um, to, to, to live a life or even be happy. I've known in, in our, I guess, in our community, the Haitian community, Haitian parents, like how many places did they ever travel? They might go to Haiti. That's about it. A few places in Haiti. And they go right back home. Like they seem to be very happy and very well-adjusted people. But for some reason, it's not enough for us anymore. And that's because we're buying into our these lifestyles and we're forcing each other to, you know, uh, get into credit card debt and then be desperate enough to get into credit card scams. So we want to be able to really kind of shift your mindset, provide you with some context, tell you that, hey, it does cost to travel. It does cost to do all these things. But it's also very much uh, cheap to just sit in, in, in inner peace, listen to some good podcasts, or even talk to some friends, break out the old cards, or even the um, charades. Remember, we used to do that? That used to be cool. It used to be charades? Dope. No, you're showing your age now. Wow. No, not charades. <laughs> no. I thought you were going to say solitary or, or what, space solitary? or something. So, you, so, so that's not even older than that? Char uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Charades, but, uh, where people get together and did the whole, you know what? Yeah, I'm whatever. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know charades. But um, we, we, we really fail to forget online is not real life. It's, it's not real life at all. Like some of the things that I hear in, in uh, people and their commentary and all this like foolishness, and don't get me wrong, it's very funny. I love my friends sharing things, but it's not real life. The things that are going on, people are curating, and Lovely mentioned this on a few episodes ago, people are curating these videos. They're actually going in editing what they want to display to um, the internet so people can see, people can visualize and kind of like, you know, um, dream of placing themselves in those uh, different countries, different places, which is admirable. Like some people want to travel and that's great, but you can do that whenever you are fully ready to do so. Don't just push yourself and you're not financially prepared, right? And it's not real life. I think we find, we try to find validation for people that don't know us personally and think is 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 a part of our everyday life and it's not it's something that I'm always you know challenging myself to understand is that the more we start engaging in things that doesn't have anything to do with us it's not our reality yet in some I guess subconscious way we think it is and and so far from the truth so don't place those things that you see as as form as part of your your reality because it's not and um yeah like Lauren says just go outside and go to your community and it's crazy to me and it really gets to me sometimes people don't know what's going on in their own community their own state some people even haven't been out <laughs> you know their own uh, state like really try like Florida is huge. Some people haven't been to Orlando, Tampa, like, you know, they haven't been to the Panama, like they haven't been to all these places. Like Florida is huge. It's, it's more than Miami, <laughs> you know, it's, it's more than all these, you know, places that you see online. Like there's so much of beautiful lakes and um, reservoirs and uh, national parks that I really want to explore someday and I'm going to do it. Right. So that's something we have to tap in. So what what is in our backyard and kind of live in our own reality and, and, and feel what it is to really be alive and not just look at other people living their lives online. We gotta do better. Yeah, this conversation. Yeah, this guy. This conversation got too real for lovely. She kind of okay, stepped we out gotta mentally. We have to do better with this silence. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm out here just chilling. <laughs> like, I, I, hey, you know, I'm responding to the people that hate me on it, it, the internet, but I think we've actually covered a lot of the the finer points to what credit card, um, at least where it started. I, and I'll, I'll leave this tidbit. I always thought that to be interesting that Bank of America actually started Visa. Crazy enough. It was actually their credit card. They, they started it out, out on a whim and it ended up taking off and they, I guess they spun it off into its own company. So that's Bank of America and Visa. Look it up. It's the exact same company. It's hilarious. Lovely.
What's good? She wanted no, to make some Sorry, nice guys. eggs. No, 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 I'm not. Yeah, even... she's trying. Yeah, she's probably folding uh, eggs. Folding you know, living, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, living her millennial life with the all white background in her home. I got it. No, I actually got this swiping headache that just started to pound. So I was like, okay, let me, let me kind of yeah, like. Yeah, that's called COVID. But let's let's continue no! on. So we, no! <laughs> thank you everyone for for your attention on this uh, episode. We uh, try to cover as much as possible how we got to this point. And hopefully, um, I'll, I'll leave you with some solutions, things you can actually do. Uh, if you're actually struggling uh, with credit card debt, do not worry. It takes a while to fix it. There are different ways you can, can approach it. You could use the debt um, avalanche approach, which is basically you tackling the, uh, the credit card with the highest interest to knock it down as fast as possible. It's the most effective, and it saves you more money, um, um, and, and it's also faster. The next uh, approach is the debt um, snowball, which is a little bit more popular. It's a lot more uh, cerebral in nature. So typically people seem to love the debt snowball because you're tackling the smallest debt as fast as possible. You're knocking it out. So you, you're feeling more of these wins. So let's say if you have five credit cards, you knock out one, you knock out the next. And at some point you knock out the third one. It's, it's going to start feeling a little bit more like you're regaining some level of um, consumer confidence. And hopefully, hopefully, you don't get back into actually spending more money and creating a whole new uh, credit card balance again. So the goal in your life is to actually um, try to knock it out as soon as possible. And also remember that over time, the average household will end up paying um, about half a million dollars worth of interest if they got car loans, houses, and um, credit cards, student loans, all of that. So the, the, the best thing that for, you know, for you to do is pay down your debt as soon as possible so you don't incur that much um, of those um, fees over time. And you can actually use your money to do the things that you love to do, either spend time with your friends, family, travel, you know, paint, whatever it is, is just up to you. And I'll pass it over to the rest of my co-hosts for their closing remarks. Yeah, lovely, you still got COVID. Oh my goodness. No, I don't. <laughs> like what you paused in. Like you're like, mm, yeah, because I, I was going to say something and love you. Just like, okay. I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm here. No, uh, my final thoughts are just take it slow and change your behavior. And behavior doesn't get changed overnight. So I think you have to figure out what type of person you are. Um, I'll take my gym example. I, ha I talk about the gym now a lot because that's where I spend a good amount of my four or five days a week. Um, and it's taught me that, that I have a gym that's here on, um, in our community and it wasn't far. It's like right there. But last year and the years before that I've lived here, it's always an excuse of why I couldn't make it down. But then when I made it a priority, I put like my, my calories that I need to burn on my, um, Apple watch. I'm like, okay, I have to be down there four times a week, come hell or um, high water. So yesterday I had a crazy kind of day, but at 11 o'clock at night, I'm not letting midnight cross over to the next day without getting done. I went down. I did my 45 minutes. Was it the best workout? No. Did it get done? Yes. Did I focus on my form? Yep. I say all this to say it's the same thing with credit card debt that you want to eliminate or more discipline. You need to figure out what your triggers are. You need to figure out what lies you're telling yourself. And that might mean stopping cold turkey. That might mean figuring out what do you need to start paying first? Is it an extra $100? Is it extra $250? Do what you need to do so that you can live the life that you actually want to live, which is the life where you're not under stress. That's my two cents. Yeah, you you all made some absolutely great points and uh, tidbits and actionable steps, what we do here at T, TFG. Um, I would say is that what Lovely mentioned is to take your time and it doesn't happen overnight, but also educate yourself about credit card and how it can really impact you financially, especially if you have short-term goals. If you want to be a homeowner or something that you want to, you know, purchase a new car or new EV car, whatever it may be, just understand that credit is another access and a tool to wealth. And you can purchase things or you can do things to kind of put you in a better financial position for yourself. So now is the best time, if any time is now, to kind of see where can you do, what can you do to be at the best financial position as possible? Because if we are entering a recession, which we are, um, 
you want to make sure that you are your liabilities are very small or not as big as someone else who didn't take you know their credit card debt as seriously and wasn't educating themselves about their credit card debt um so really just take your time um, it doesn't happen overnight when i was in credit card debt years ago and had crazy uh credit score the first thing i really did really educate myself and look at all your bills and look at all your interest rates and see what can you do to eliminate those things lawrence mentioned about the avalanche uh, method there's so many debt methods that you can use um but give yourself grace you know forgive yourself and from there on and just make try to make better decisions because it will cost you in the long run and that's what we're really trying to prevent is it's not short-term gratitude it's not any of those things it's long term because you want to be at the best financial position and the best life for yourself in the long term so that's my tidbit thank you guys for tuning in to another great awesome episode of tfg my name is Atlanta Elson. You can find me on the IG streets at Atlanta underscore Elson. Where they can find you guys? The neighborhood finance guy on the interwebs. You can find me anywhere. Lawrence, like, just Google me. <laughs> exactly. It pops up though. I'd be like, I'm hot. I'm hot. Let's go. Oh man. You can find me at Lovely More Dallas on my Instagram, on LinkedIn as well. Um, it's my full first and um, last name. That is where I get down. Thanks again, guys, so much. TFG, we are out. Thank you for listening to the Financial Griot Podcast, powered by the Wealth Builders Collective. 